Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. All right, welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. I am here again with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. Today is your second conversation with Dr. Tim Pitchell. Going to be, I suspect, yet another really important conversation with him. We're going to lead off today, though. There's a children's book called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. So what does that have to do with today's conversation? Well, apparently, Todd, you had never heard of it until now, right? Oh, I've never heard of the book. No, I haven't. It's one of my favorite books, and my children also loved it. It's uh, written by uh, Laura Joff uh, Numeroff. I think I'm saying it right, I hope. Uh, she's an award-winning children's book, author of children's books. And, you know, in this book, it talks about a little boy who gives a mouse a cookie. And just as anyone would, the mouse asked for a glass of milk. And then he asked for a straw to drink that milk. Then he says, well, I need a mirror to check and see if, I have any milk mustache. Then he proceeds to ask the boy for nail scissors so that he can trim the hair <laughs> in the mirror. And then then he says, I need a broom so I can sweep the hair trimmings and so on and so forth. So what's so funny about this book is there's this boy who is at the beck and call of this mouse and does everything and anything this mouse asks him. He runs around a ragged serving the mouse. And as I uh, think about my conversation with Dr. Pitchell that I'm about to have, who's going to give us some actual strategy, and I was uh, reflecting on last week's conversation about procrastination, when somebody asked this author, uh, how did she come up with this idea? And she said, well, I you know, went to the closet to look for something, and then I saw these pencils, and then began to sharpen those pencils, and then... I needed to empty that into the trash and then I, you know, so, so on and so forth. So there are two things from executive function point of view that uh, come to mind that when we are in the midst of uh, about to start a task or get things done, you know, we have a lot of interruptions, a lot of roadblocks and some roadblocks are outside us, but some roadblocks are within us. And procrastination is such one such thing that uh, creates a roadblock in execution. So Executive function is nothing but doing what you say you will do in a timely manner and something that yields outcomes that you desire and with future self in mind and procrastination blocks all of that. And that's why this is such an important topic. So that brings me to our guest who we had last week, but I'm going to introduce him again. Dr. Tim Pitchell is the director of the Center for Initiatives in Education and Associate Professor of Psychology at Crompton University, Ottawa in Canada, and Tim has developed an international reputation for his research on procrastination. In addition to journal articles summarizing his research with his students, Tim has co-edited two books, the most recent one being Procrastination, Health and Wellbeing, and I highly recommend both his books. He's also an uh, author of Solving the Procrastination Puzzle, it, a concise guide uh, to strategies for change. It's a small handbook worth keeping next to your bed and using this as a how-to guide for everything in life. <laughs> you can learn more about his research and access his Psychology Today blog or his I Procrastinate podcast at procrastination.ca. Tim's research is complemented by his passion for teaching, for which he has won numerous awards, including the 3M National Teaching Fellowship, Ontario Federation of University Association Teaching Award, and University Medal for Distinguished Teaching. Tim has been an invited speaker across the country, working with professors of universities and colleges to enhance teaching and learning. And he is a prolific uh, podcaster. And I will have all those links on my website. And I highly recommend people to do what I do, which is I'm addicted to his podcast. So I can't wait to start my discussion. Todd, now you know everything you need to know about if you give mouse a cookie. <laughs> well, you know, even though I'm a 49-year-old child, it sounds like a great book, so I may have to track it down. And it sounds like it symbolizes how I live my life, going from task to task, trying to avoid the hard stuff. 
So it sounds perfect for me. All right. Well, like you, Suchita, I too am excited about this uh, follow-up conversation with Dr. Pitchell. So let's get to it. So here is Suchita's second conversation with Dr. Tim Pitchell. Welcome back, Dr. Pitchell. I'm so delighted to have you. So we get to talk about how to manage a procrastination. So my first question is, can we stop procrastinating? And is this tied with willpower or is this more than that? Can you please walk us through that? Yes. The good news is that we can stop procrastinating if that procrastination is a problem for us. But it's not just an, uh, an instance of willpower because, in fact, framing it that way makes it sound like we're under-regulating ourselves, that we just have to put more muscle behind our, our intentions and they will happen. And that's to misunderstand the whole process. In fact, uh, Roy Baumeister and Dan Tice and Ellen Bratlaski, to name three prominent American psychologists who've done research in this area, say that it's not an under-regulation, particularly of emotion, but a misregulation. What we're doing is we're, we think we're going to make our feel, ourselves feel better by avoiding, and so we avoid. And that's the misregulation. And, it, and it's not an under-regulation in the sense that we, would, we just have to put more effort in behind it. What we have to come to understand is that we're making the wrong choice. We're misunderstanding, misregulating our emotional state by using a, a really problematic avoidance strategy. So the first point of change is awareness, awareness of what procrastination really is. It's not a time management problem. It's an emotion management problem because procrastination is an emotion-focused coping strategy. I face a task that makes me just want to scream or I just resent or I'm bored by it. But basically what it comes down to is this, and everybody gets this. We see the task and we think, I don't want to, I don't feel like it. And there's the six-year-old alive and well in us because we hear that from our kids all the time. I don't want it. I don't feel like it. But we've got it in our bones as well. And it's not just a matter then of exercising more willpower. It's understanding that, well, you know, our motivational state doesn't have to match the task at hand. That's a really powerful statement for me. Mm. My motivational state does not have to match the task at hand. And I don't know where I ever had that belief, but most of us seem to have it. You know, I, I have to be in the mood, so to speak. But that's not true of most things in life. And just as social psychologists have shown us that attitudes often follow behaviors, not behaviors following attitudes. And I would argue the same thing, that motivation follows action, not necessarily the other way around. Once we get started, things start to change. So again, it's not really a matter of willpower. Willpower can make a difference, of course. If I have a little, uh, some resources I can put to the task, that's great. But you got to use them strategically. You know, if it's, you think it's all about just exercising will, sooner or later you can say, but I've got none left. It's not really just a matter of willpower. I think that's really powerful. I don't think people understand this. Can you go a little bit deeper into this idea of I don't need to be in the mood and I don't need to have a perfect reason or perfect timing? It's just that right, right now is the time and I just need to do it. Yes. And so, and you're also saying something, which is the difference between the misregulation versus assumption that it's underregulated means that I am actually not doing enough versus I am just uh, misdirecting the resources to do something else instead of doing the right thing. Correct? Yeah, that's a, that's a great summary. And what I'll add to that then is to say that, you know, we, we all have goals and intentions and some of them are not very, they're half baked. They could be more articulated because that helps. It has, it puts a little bit more motivation behind a plan if it's a bit more articulated. But even if I have a vague notion of what I need to do today, if my immediate reaction is I don't feel like it, I don't want to, well, I, I have to do something with that. The Buddhists uh, are so insightful in terms of this notion of monkey mind, that our minds Ooh. are busy places. Our, our minds you know, our, our brains basically do two things, think and feel, think and feel, and they constantly think and feel. And I don't have to take it all so seriously because my brain is just busy doing that. So just because you have, I have a thought or a feeling doesn't mean I have to act on it. And anybody who ever examines their thoughts will know that because our thoughts, I, I often joke with audiences when I speak to them, imagine I had a technology and maybe Google or Apple or some other company will invent it where I could have a bubble appear above your head and in that bubble would appear all your thoughts and feelings. But the only control you had was to turn it off or leave it on. I can guarantee everyone would shut it off because we're so squirrely. We have all these <laughs> thoughts and feelings. 
And in fact, that's what this notion of monkey mind is. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because I once heard a monk speak about this so directly. And he said, it's unfortunate that it's the word monk because it, 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 it interacts with this word monkey. But this Buddhist, <laughs> monk, this Buddhist monk said, we have to give the monkey something to do. And I thought, that's brilliant. That's what it's all about, that I can't. And researchers in psychology know that know this, like James Gross and others who do research on emotion. You can't suppress your emotions. You can't deny your emotions. It's not a very effective strategy. Instead, you got to give the monkey something to do. So this is my go-to strategy. And I have to use it daily when I, I think to myself, I don't want to, I don't feel like it, which is frequently. And I say, what's the next action, Tim? What would be the next action you'd have to take if you were going to do this? And I add this little uh, extra piece just to trick myself, but I'm not going to. I don't set myself up right away. I don't push myself too hard. I say, what's the next action I would need to do if I was going to do this task, but I'm not going to? I say, <laughs> well, I have to open my laptop and look at the email and see what that student needs. And I think, well, I could do that. And uh, now, now I'm on my way. Because I've broken that task down to an action. And we do these little actions. And of course, we bootstrap or we prime the pump for actually being engaged. So I'm giving the monkey something to do. I'm saying, monkey, don't think about the task. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, monkey, what's the next action? And now the monkey's got something to do and Tim gets moving. It's tremendously powerful because now I'm not focused on my emotions and the misregulation of my emotions or feeling good now. I'm focused on the action. And I've made it small enough that I can take that action. So I love what, what I'm hearing. You're saying that it's very critical that we concretize our goals into smaller attainable steps, whether we actually take that step or not, or at least make that mind. <laughs> it's really like sounds to me that, you know, when you are sitting at, uh, at the edge of the pool and the water is very cold and you're really not sure I want to jump into the water and because you are imagining how cold and freezing it's going to be, then you put that toe and then put your foot and then put your leg. Uh, you know, it's kind of immersing yourself in the task uh, one step at a time. Now, is this something one can do for themselves or do we do better when somebody else facilitates that for us? That's a great question. It's going to take me back to your first question about willpower. A good friend of mine and colleague by the name of Joel Anderson is at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And he and a philosopher from the University of Toronto by the name of Joe Heath wrote a chapter in a book in 2011. The book was called The Thief of Time, Philosophical Essays on Procrastination. And it's a great collection of chapters. Wow. Jo Joe and Joel wrote about extended will. And I need to explain just a little bit about this to answer your question. So extended will comes from, uh, borrows from the notion of extended cognition. So if I said to you, what's three times three, you'd say nine. If I said, what's 387 times 1,462? You'd say, I can't do that. And I'd say, well, you can't do it in your head, but here's a paper and a pencil. And that's extended cognition. You're extending your ability to think by using this tool. And I think it's brilliant what their basic premise is, is that we kind of think of willpower always just as this resource within us. And this answers your question. It's better if I can rely on the world around me, what some psychologists call ecological affordances. I try to set up the environment in such a way that it actually helps me, just like the paper and pencil help someone think. And so we can use the world around us. So for example, let's say someone says, well, what I'm procrastinating on is getting fit. I say I'm going to go to the gym, but I never do. Well, what you learn about yourself or what you know about yourself is that you'd never let someone else down like you do yourself. So I say, all right, then I'm going to make a promise to Todd that he and I will always go and work out together. And I would never let Todd down. And so it comes time to go to the gym. I go, I don't want to go to the gym. Oh, but Todd's waiting for me and off I go. And I've used that to help me get along. And so we can see that in, with students in terms of study groups and other kinds of relationships. And also ecological affordance comes when the way we set up our environment. I try to study and we tell this to children all the time in front of a television set with our phone next to us and some other device open, oh, well, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Some of the ecological affordances there are to preempt that which tempts, you know, reduce the distractions so that you're not setting yourself up for failure. So on the one hand, you're setting up uh, shoots, uh, easier ways to slide into the stuff that you want to do. 
and ladders, making it more difficult to get to the stuff that you typically do by habit. And that's the brilliance of uh, Anderson and Heath's notion of extended will. So this is a very interesting concept about making environmental modifications to support your failure to adhere to a plan that you have or kind of avoidances that that make you not achieve your plans. Is there anything else we can do to pursue the goals, not just in one domain, though, but many multiple, multiple domains? Yes. In fact, I thought of it when we first started to talk together when you taught you when you use the word goal, because we we think we're saying the thing, same thing when we say goal. I can have this broad goal intention. I can have a goal intention of finish my degree or become fit. But those are very vaguely defined things and they might have some motivational properties, but they don't, won't necessarily precipitate action. They won't necessarily lead me to an immediate action. Instead, Peter Galwitzer and his colleagues have defined a notion called implementation intentions, not just goal intentions but your implementation intentions, and it sounds like the word itself, how are you going to implement it? And Peter and his colleagues' research shows that certain forms of implementation intentions are more powerful. They're, they're kind of when then, when this happens, then I'll do that. And the form that they used often is if this, then that to achieve this. So for example, when I finish this interview, then I will go take my two dogs for a walk. And so my habit might be that I'm just going to kick back and maybe check my email, not even necessarily entertain myself, but do something else that's quite a habit in my life, which is do some more work. But what I need in my life is probably some more exercise and my dog certainly want that. So when I say, when the interview ends, then I will take my dog for a walk. Now I've put the stimulus for the action in the environment. And so that when something happens in the environment, it triggers me to think, oh yeah, I'm taking the dogs for a walk. So this is very powerful because it helps us break habits which don't rely on the environment. Well, they rely on the environment, but they already have that habitual response in there. If this happens, then I do that unconsciously. But instead now I'm setting up an alternative response, but quite explicitly. So again, another key thing that we can use across any kind of task are these notions of implementation intentions. If I have a commitment to the task, I then basically say, okay, when this happens, then I'm going to do that. And we find, it, well, the research shows over and over again, even specific research related to procrastination, that we're more likely to act when we make an implementation intention. Wonderful. So is there any way you can explain to us that procrastination is more prevalent or uh, it gets exaggerated in certain circumstances for people? And is there a way that they can think about it uh, going into that situation? Is there any way to predict that I'm likely to procrastinate because this is the nature of the task? Well, that's a good question in terms of someone's awareness of themselves, that I'd have to have a certain amount of awareness to recognize that it's in situations where I'm uncertain or where I feel afraid this notion of fear of failure has been studied a great deal in relation to procrastination, and it, it's moderated by other person variables, like how confident I feel. But notwithstanding that, certainly things that we're fearful of and that causes uncertainty and anxiety, we're more likely to want to avoid. That's that emotional response. So I think that we have to recognize that in ourselves. But it, it can be even more mundane. Uh, I know just yesterday, both my daughter and my wife we were, out, we were swimming in our pool. I was thinking about you talking about putting your foot in the cold water. I do that a lot. We did it yesterday. And my wife said, you know what? I'm going to get up really early tomorrow, go for a run and then go for a swim. And I'm thinking to myself, that's unlikely. <laughs> and it, it, and it, it didn't happen because, you know, Dan Gilbert from Harvard University has taught us a lot about how we predict our future moods. He calls it affective forecasting, predicting how we're going to feel in the future. And the gist of it is that we rely on the present to predict the future. Now, my daughter and my wife were both enjoying the fact that we had cycled yesterday and went for a swim and the, and the physical activity was wonderful. And then it makes you feel really good. So you make this noble intention for tomorrow. And when you try to think about how I'm gonna feel about tomorrow, you use the present. Well, how are they feeling right then? They were feeling great. So they thought, yeah, I'll <laughs> feel like doing it tomorrow. But I think there's another example of how we can really set ourselves up in that way of being predictably irrational we're using the present, but we have to kind of step back a little bit and have a sober second thought and say, okay, I'm a little pumped up now because I'm feeling so good. 
how realistic is it that I'm setting this attention to get up at five o'clock in the morning when I don't typically get up at five? So I think that's really important that we're able to know some of these psychological principles and then evaluate our own lives and intentions in relation to those. And that's why I think your own work is so important. You teach people volitional skills. You give them insight about how we think. You give them insight of, uh, in terms of the tensions, in terms of processing in the brain. And those are fundamental to successful change. Oh, wonderful <laughs> explanation there. I was uh, going to share with you some of the tech strategies that I have used. One is I do something called error um, a glitch list. So I have people write down things that didn't go per plan or things that did not get done. So I have a very elaborate planning system that I teach. And and this glitch list is is a list of things that didn't work out. And then it can have many, many things. And so once that list comes to me, which may have five or six items in it, I have uh, you know clients categorize them into uh, things that um, you had no plan for. You had an intention, but no plan. Something that you had a plan, but no you know, motivation or or you didn't stick with it or you, you kind of gave up last minute. Or the last category is you got interrupted and you couldn't do it because the interruption was larger than the the time you allocated for the task. Oh, and you know, there are many ways to do it. But one of the things that I find very amusing about is that this unreasonable um, expectations people have from themselves. They have things like a plan, a family reunion over, you know, in one day. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know how that that's possible. You know, you, you're just not going to do it. You you need a plan. You need a plan to make a plan. How am I going to plan uh, the family reunion? So I find a, a lot of times, particularly those with executive dysfunction are stuck in not having a good appraisal system. They don't have the awareness of themselves and that they're, they're not the best judge of their true capacities. And so any um, methods that you have found that will make people more aware of their own skill set or their approach to managing their tasks? Nothing comes from our research that speaks to that. And I think you've articulated it better than most. I would probably just lay on top of that the simple question of how do you feel when you list these various tasks? Because so much of my emphasis still is on the emotional response. I, I do think that it's absolutely imperative that people have the volitional skills and the executive function skills that you're speaking of. But in some ways, I would always argue that the plan is necessary, but not sufficient. Because many of us, even after making these elaborate plans, and even realistic ones, will get to that point in time when it's supposed to be enacted. And what they say is, or think, I don't want to, I don't feel like it. So I think the two have to dance hand in hand. And I think that's why it's an interesting conversation between the two of us today, because your emphasis is more cognitive than, than mine, and mine is more effective than yours. But the two are always working together within the human being. And I think together, I think people can get a feel for the fact that, yeah, I need to develop more planning skills, but I can't ignore the fact that later on, I could still say, I don't want to. And then giving the monkey something to do or recognizing I don't have to be in the mood. Like that's kind of a myth. So I don't have any specific things cognitively to add to your perspective. Got it. So do you recommend any therapeutic processes in the area of uh psychological treatments uh, or have they shown to be effective such as you know CBT or uh, DBT or anything like that? Well I'm not a clinician but I have colleagues that are and they certainly speak highly of CBT and uh, I'm trying to think of another form of therapy that uh, we published a paper on what I did with a acceptance commitment therapy. Uh, oh yes another... I know acceptance yes. Yes and that 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 uh, I met a, a therapist and researcher from Quebec, another province in Canada, for those of you who don't know, uh, French speaking. And they had been working in this area and we collaborated and they, they taught me a whole new area because they are clinicians. And we did see quite a bit of evidence that this is a good approach. And, and I understand why in terms of uh, developing commitment is essential and uh, the sense of acceptance of oneself and task at hand, those sorts of processes. But I'm not a clinician at heart, but certainly those who are, who've written extensively about it, like Wendy Dryden in the UK will talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's very important. From our own research, I would argue that something that's new and overlooked, I think, or could be emphasized more at least, is a little bit of time travel. By that, I mean thinking about future self and bringing future self closer. As I mentioned in passing, we tend to think about future self like a stranger, 
Uh, Hal Hirschfield demonstrated this in his research. And one of my students, Eve Marie Bluin Houdon, uh, did some excellent work translating that into student academic procrastination. And she had students do a guided meditation to think about future self more concretely, both from the first person and the third person. And when they did that, they developed more empathy for future self, and that seemed to be related to greater decreases in procrastination. So I think that to the extent that we can integrate our present self with our future self, who's getting jerked around with procrastination, present self can make help make different decisions. So that's another area that I think could be emphasized in any of these therapies that, that uh, you mentioned. Thank you for sharing that. I am familiar with Tal Hirschfeld's work, and I have had him as a guest on the this podcast, uh, but I'm not really familiar with this uh, time travel techniques that you mentioned, which sound fascinating. And also, I think, as I understand from the uh, future self research, I think we, and you have mentioned this earlier as well, that we consider the more gap, time gap there is between current self and future self, our perception or emotional relationship to that future self is as good or as bad as with a stranger. Mm -hmm. And we have no less compassion and less uh, empathy for a stranger than we have for ourselves. So there is a certain bias to take decisions in favor of uh, someone, which is me, <laughs> than my future self, which appears to be a stranger. And <laughs> um, so I'll share quick techniques that I have used in my practice where when I do uh, start the cognitive retraining process, I may um, do goal assessment and goal planning, and then we create a roadmap of what is it that I'm going to be doing for myself? And then I, I have a banner uh, that I put out that says, Dear Future Self. And then the student stands under it. And then I video record them reading this letter that's addressed from the future self to the current self. And then the uh, the uh, future uh, the future self is thanking the current self for all the hard work that went into making the future self better. And, and so we take those goals and the processes and habits that the student is uh, planning to commit himself to, but the future self thanks. And then the part of training is on a regular basis to watch that video. So, as, uh, <laughs> so as the person travels through time, they mm -hmm. begin to understand, wait a minute, that person is talking to me. Wait, that's me? And so I have a date stamp there and I have uh, all these little prompts that remind the person that this is the future you talking to you. <laughs> Yes, I think I think all of these things are, are foundational to making change. But I'd even add another layer to that, and something we haven't talked about at all. There is a number of existential therapies. You know, people like Mick Cooper or Bo Jacobson, Schneider, uh, others that have written about existential therapies. And the reason I bring that up is that I think at heart, procrastination is a deeply existential issue. It's about, in a profound way, not getting on with life itself. You know, that we sometimes treat life as like it's limitless, especially when we're younger. But anyone can do it as if there will be a tomorrow and I can do it tomorrow. And of course, that's that notion of carpe diem that cuts both ways. You know, make hay while the sun shines or eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow. You might not be here, so to speak. So <laughs> there, there is that tension between the two. But what I find in a lot of people, and I would think you see this in your own clients, is that they lack a deep sense of agency in terms of this is my life and these are my goals and I want to act on them. And I think without that sense of agency and this existential notion of a commitment to self, not just commitment to a task, but commitment to oneself that can be uh, profoundly life-giving and really will get to the heart of beating a procrastination habit very quickly because it changes your the frame of which you uh, I use as a point of reference for your decision-making. And I've seen that happen and I get emails from people all over the world that talk about how that's really made a change in their lives. But I often talk to students about notion of agency. Even Viktor Frankl, you know, the Viennese psychiatrist, Absolutely. in his own autobiography, wrote about basically procrastination and how he learned to do the difficult things first thing in the morning and how he learned not to waste time. So he had time for the important things in life. And what he was speaking of then was typically time with family and friends. So I think that we all have to learn these things as well. It's not just about our thinking and our feeling, but a deep sense of the I who lives in this world, who has goals and can act on those goals. I love the way you are ending this. I think this is a profound way to shift uh, one's own thinking. I think this life, not only that is a gift, but it's also a life to be 
lived with purpose. And if I have a purpose, then I have a commitment to see that purpose being fulfilled. And I love, love this idea. Thank you so much, Dr. Pitchell, for coming on the podcast and and sharing your wisdom. You are a wealth of knowledge and uh, you're brilliant and uh, your insights are are going to make a huge difference in our listeners, uh, uh, not just the understanding of procrastination, but you have given them a lot of hope. So I thank you for that. Oh, Suchet, that's been my pleasure. And that's uh, very kind of you to say those things. All right. Wow. Uh, As I suspected, yet another great conversation with Dr. Tim Pitchell, Sujeda. Goodness, I don't know where to start. So I'll ask you, any initial thoughts? Oh, absolutely, Todd. Wasn't he great? He is so wonderful in explaining things as well as his vast knowledge. We, I wish uh, we had a lot more time with him. But for starters, what comes to mind is procrastination is a tantrum thrown by the emotional brain, not wanting to do something that we ourselves have identified as an important and worthy pursuit. So to summarize from last session, the signature characteristic of procrastination is that it's a deliberate or intentional delay, and on top of that, it's unnecessary one. So obviously, a thought comes to mind that is a procrastinator lacking motivation? And is there a delay because of missing thrust that propels the person through willpower into action? But as Tim was saying, you know, he was very emphatic about that, that it is not just a matter of willpower. Even though it's quite tempting to assume procrastinators, procrastination is failure of putting will behind a choice to pursue a worthy goal, but it's not. So procrastination is very much connected uh, to misregulation rather than the underregulation. You know, the act of putting off uh, to feel good now is completely misguided by this belief that by putting off, I'm going to feel good and that feeling good will make me better or make me more prepared to pursue it next time when I try it. And that never happens. So the truth is uh, that we need to recognize uh, that this is an avoidance that we are engaging in and it's a problematic behavior. So that's kind of the, you know, initial overview of what I thought as soon as we finished this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I think of myself, Sucheta, I mean, I have ambitious goals. I have things I want to accomplish. But despite that, I still procrastinate. So it appears that having a goal isn't enough. Yeah? Yeah, that's a great thought, Todd. In Psychology of Action, I think uh, uh, Tim mentioned this, that researcher Brian Little uh, proposes that fulfilling intentions has four parts. First is inception, second is planning, third is action, and fourth is completion. Uh, And what's inception? Inception is conceiving goals. So on any given day, you know, goals can be categorized into two groups. One is called approach goals. For example, you're exercising to lose weight. So you're approaching your intention to achieve something. And then second is those that are called avoidance goals. That means exercising to avoid osteoporosis. So planning involves task management and sequencing and creating a map of execution. And then execution is twofold, which is taking action and staying committed till the end. So that is the composite of that uh, psychology of action, so to speak. So conceiving goals and desiring to meet them is not so hard, but staying committed to them and accomplishing them is particularly much more difficult. And uh, it's even so when there's a large time gap. So that's the idea that one needs to focus when working with people who are procrastinating. And other thought that comes to my mind is that just having goals is not enough, that there are a lot of uh, reasons that that there's a breakdown in goal pursuit. So Tim has a great blog, you know, he's a contributor to Psychology Today. And in one of his blogs, he talks about that there are four ways uh, a breakdown can happen when we are pursuing goals. So the first one, for example, is one may struggle to get started. Second, maybe that one uh, may have problems on uh, in staying the course. You know, you, you get started. And as I talked about earlier, the, if you give a mouse a cookie, you know, that uh, you started with your goal, for example, to eat the cookie, but then that leads to the next action, then that leads to next action. But so you are veered away from the original path that you may have considered as part of your plan. The third part is that one may be reluctant to disengage from an in- ineffective strategies that uh, one is using to achieve the goals. And um, in some cases, there's, that's a lot of rigidity or 
uh, feeling that you a perfectionist attitude may step in and then you may want to do it that way and that way only. And uh, then you may get stuck and uh, uh, not change your ways. And the fourth part is the fourth uh, way that the breakdown may occur is that one may have genuine problems with the willpower. So, for example, if you have done some resisting, then you may suffer from ego de- depletion. And um, I think in my previous podcast, when I had Bomeister, um, we talked about this, that not being able to uh, stay the track because of exhaustion and uh, having resisted previous temptations, then you don't have enough resist- resistance left in you to um, resist uh, the interruptions in your path. So bottom line is assessing uh, the goals and connecting them to the the original reason why you even conceived the goal is really an re- important part of strategizing. So, so Jada, any other important factors that you think we should be aware of that are important to bring various strategies into view or into focus? You know, that's a great question, Todd. As Tim was talking about procrastination, you know, my head was churning out ideas as to how can I help uh, my clients and how can people who listen to this and who have children and who, who are educators who are working with procrastinators, uh, how can they think? So the most important thing I find is that how do you frame the strategic thinking process? That is the first part to it. And so, you know, Tim's message is that we can learn to handle procrastination by recognizing that it is self-defeating and we don't need to be a victim of our, our own self-defeating behaviors. And he's very optimistic that we can change our ways, which makes me very happy. And, you know, what I feel that we remind ourselves that procrastination is a form of delay used as a coping mechanism to handle the uncomfortable feelings to, uh, regarding the task or intended actions, which is inv- invoked in us, then that can also help us become very strategic about having a different uh, coping mechanism rather than avoidance. So if we pause and think about the source of these negative and aversive uh, thoughts and feelings that we have, it uh, one can realize very clearly that the mind, uh, it's the monkey mind that is uh, the root cause. So. The monkey mind excels at being the monkey mind. So what is it doing? It's busy, busy, busy churning out thoughts and excuses and pushbacks. So deriving strategies by no longer focusing on that mind will be a great prospect. And so uh, there are a lot of examples of that uh, in mindfulness as well. But instead of uh, saying, I don't like this, uh, this is uh, not a good idea, Uh, I don't feel like it, you can say, I think I'm feeling that I don't want to do it. So there's a there's a way to kind of self-distance and take a better perspective on yourself and have a different approach to uh, cope with this aversion or uncomfortable feeling we are, we, we are struggling with. So now I'm thinking about self-regulation. So share some thoughts, if you can, about how we can use that to rein in procrastination through self-regulation. And this was the most powerful point for me. You know, I... I was thinking about procrastination in my life. And of course, I am uh, struggling with it on an everyday basis. So I would love this idea that he was talking about that a goal pursuit is a, is great on paper, but it's, it's a great challenge to go through the goal pursuit. And um, we need to really pay attention to something that we are good at. So let's say you're thumbing through a magazine and you come across a couple romantically leaning into each other while looking at the sunset and you look closely and read the caption and you realize they are on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. So this greatly inspires you to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and with your honey. And so you share this desire uh, and that becomes an intention. So then you go and persuade somehow your, your husband or wife that why don't we take this on ourselves and you're quite excited and then you kind of even look through some dates. And then when you start looking at the flights, then you look at the altitude, then you re- realize that, oh, you have altitude sickness. Then do I need to do a lot of preparation? Do I need to take medicine? And then your, your effort or your, you know, as you move away from this wonderful big picture idea into the finer granular executionary process, you start getting cold feet. And It's easy to either give up the goal completely or to procrastinate uh, having to do it. Now, this may not be the best example because nothing is hinging upon 
uh, me climbing Mount Man- <laughs> Kilimanjaro. So it's easy to give that goal up. But imagine uh, doing taxes. You know, the same predicament may happen that I really, really, really need to get, you know, the taxes in because I have not filed it for two years and this is such a critical time. Otherwise, I'm going to incur a penalty. So what happens is we fail to conceive the journey through time and that failure to conceive a journey through time is uh, also explained through something called temporal self-regulation theory. And that's when I think a lot of people start kind of having cold feet. And for me, what was really, uh, that spoke to me was uh, when Tim said that uh, we can use self-control from one area of life where we have successfully applied ourselves to our own benefit, we can transfer that and we can apply that to the area of life where we are procrastinating. And that has been a wonderful message for me because I have been thinking about a um, lot of self-control I, uh, I demonstrate in so many parts of my life. I'm very committed. I follow through. And particularly, I do that when I'm committed to other people. And so I have recognized that if I shift my mindset and use this as a strategy, then I can really become even more successful and less of a procrastinator. You know, there's a wonderful article written by this Dutch researcher, uh, Wendell Van Erd. I hope I'm saying it right. And I'm quoting her. She says that it's also possible to train competencies relevant to self-regulation in general, such as self-knowledge, self-monitoring, feedback seeking, and awareness of um, effects on one's own behavior. This may lead to setting more realistic goals and knowing whether procrastination will lead to dysfunctional effects. And I thought this particular, you know, research findings also are very meaningful uh, to me. And in Tim's one of podcasts, he discussed this at length, which was very helpful for me to understand his perspective on this. But what I'm saying here is self-regulation is all about developing greater self-knowledge and uh, then also using that self-knowledge to monitor yourself through passage of time and then seeking feedback and using um, the awareness that you keep gathering about your actions or inactions to feed into. So imagine the car that gives you uh, information from side windows, I mean, the side mirrors and then the, the you know, the windshield through which we look and and the rear view mirror, all those things are feeding into your ability to judge how close you are to the other cars and how far you are from uh, other cars, uh, whether it's safe to, you know, um, turn right, turn left. So that's the way I feel we need to activate these mirrors uh, as a feedback system. And honestly, this is what I'm really good at in terms of my work. Uh, my my therapy, cognitive retraining and executive function training is extremely centered or founded in this these principles of, of self-regulation. So I feel very confident about that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. Any thoughts on ACT therapy? Should we be thinking about that more? Yeah, I think we didn't have uh, adequate time to go into the depth of it. So I'm just going to give a little bit of more summary for our listeners that the acceptance commitment therapy uh, model believes that feelings are normal part of being a human and thoughts cannot be avoided. Hence, instead of contesting them, arguing with them, one must make allowances to have uh, them emerge, show up, and then disappear. It's a very Zen or Buddhist thing. It's a very much in Vedantic principles. I'm familiar with spiritual practices or um, self-directed uh, attention practices that uh, Hinduism uh, recommends uh, that I'm familiar with also has a great, you know, there, there are a lot of tips as to how to do that. And um, the way our mind works is that it's really hard to avoid feelings and thoughts. So acceptance therapy says, acceptance and commitment therapy says that thoughts and feelings are fine, but there's no need to be fused with the thoughts. There's no need to kind of marry them. So the, the two elements to uh, ACT therapy, and uh, the first element is to build psychological flexibility so that you can learn to um, not allow that fusion to occur between the thoughts and the, then thoughts becoming binding to your um, whole, whole sense of reality in that moment. And and so in order to do that, one must develop the ability to pause and reflect. And then one must uh, really uh, kind of learn the knack uh, of identifying and labeling your thoughts, then becoming mindful and to uh, really practice non-judgmental awareness. So, for example, how can you witness your own 
mind's creations, which are these negative thoughts and feelings, and saying, I see anxiety coming up. I see I'm anxious. I see that I'm no longer anxious. So it's almost like I like to describe to my uh, my clients that it's imagine you are sitting in a train, and that's not something very common in America. But you know, uh, I'm from India, and I've, and I've also traveled in Europe. So when you are sitting in a fast train, a uh, lot of uh, you know the surroundings pass by very fast, and all you are left to do is you can't study them. You you just have witness them. You watch them. Oh, that was a beautiful yellow. Oh, it's gone. Oh, are those? Oh, it's gone. <laughs> so you really go, don't get a chance to study and become very uh, intrigued by those things that you witness because you are in a moving train. Similarly, you can become that witness uh, mindset, a uh, person with witness mindset. So the danger in our non-mindfulness is that we, we become quite convinced that these thoughts are real and they uh, have merit and we begin to obey them. And we consider those uh, thoughts uh, to be the guiding principle. And that's when the situation becomes sticky. So what we need to do is we need to reverse engineer that. So, um, And I explained that earlier. It's, to, it's like saying I am having the thought that I am not in a good mood. And I'm having a thought to want to eat a cookie. I'm having a thought to not call my mother back. <laughs> so instead of saying I don't want to call my mother back, you can uh, re-engineer those thought processes and become more in charge of your thinking. And so using reflection to heighten self-awareness and reassessing your thoughts and feelings is really an important step here. And there's, uh, I'm so glad that people study this and they have uh, a technique that's kind of uh, well laid out and they're experts who are ACT uh, therapists. And I will put a link at the sh- in the show notes to so that people can look up uh, how to find a therapist who can do this in their area. So in conclusion about this particular part is that once the mindfulness practices become ingrained and uh, second nature, we can become very good at not listening to the aversion uh, or the discomfort we are feeling. And we can just step over it, the discomfort and say, yeah, I think I'm not feeling very comfortable about this, but what's the next action I can take? And that was another last message about this that I think was, was very powerful, that do not forget to take action. The best remedy to procrastination is taking an action. So we must, must take actions. <laughs> well, no doubt about it. The lesson I've learned in my life is that things that I'm, I procrastinate because I'm fearing something. But once you take that first step in action, all of a sudden that fear melts away. It's, that's been the biggest thing that I've learned in dealing with this problem. And it's a big problem for me. So goodness. Uh, and now that you mentioned cookies, now that's all I can think about. So any closing thoughts, Ruteta, before uh, we wrap this episode? Yeah, thank you for asking that, Todd. Um, for starters, I want people to know that procrastination is not just a run-of-the-mill everyday challenge. And all one has to do is to get over it. That's just a myth. Uh, we can't get over procrastination. So, you know, this uh, misconceived notion we may have that all I have to do is make a little screensaver on my computer that, you know, um, saving it for last minute or whatever. <laughs> or um, maybe we put a little uh, message on Facebook saying that I'm, I've been procrastinating. And that becomes we all uh, laugh at this uh, because we can relate to it. Uh, but uh, we need to take a little bit more serious look. It runs deep and it needs intentional reprogramming. People need to excavate uh, the feelings and thoughts about the task or the goal in hand that brings these uh, negative feelings to the surface. And one needs to take a serious look at the nature of these feelings and what is the monkey mind saying to me uh, at this point? You know, so the thoughts may be that I uh, have to commit to one choice uh, over the other and that makes me feel that this is final and I don't want to do it. It could be that it's hard to figure out uh, what the task is and I don't know what to do. It could be a thought such as, it's annoying um, because it's going to require dealing with people and I can't stand people, <laughs> you know, or a thought may be generated that says that uh, this is hard work and it's tiring and my legs hurt and I'm out of breath, so I don't want to exercise. It could be, you know, things like I'm lost, or, you know, I'm not sure what the steps are. And so these are the kinds of even concretizing what is it that you are feeling uncomfortable about can be very helpful. And what was the most powerful thing for me is that, you know, Tim kind of shed a light on this perspective that there are cognitive and affective strategies to manage procrastination. You know, my, 
My career has been helping clients develop cognitive strategies related to planning, organization, task adherence, minimizing interference, etc. And the very little time I had uh, devoted to helping them deal with the affective side. Um, uh, ever since I came across uh, Tim's work, uh, mainly through his podcast, about uh, six years ago, I have brought that uh, perspective of affective strategies associated with helping clients manage their fears and aversions into my practice and um, helping them craft the message so that they can work on that monkey mind. Um, you know, this has been a shift in my uh, mindset and practice, and I hope that's a big takeaway for all those help young children, students, and young adults, and those who are interested in self-help even. That is the combination of the two can be really you know, bring a substantial impact. So finally, it won't hurt to start uh, with the self. You know, <laughs> whether you're helping people or not, I think the best place is to start helping yourself. I think we might be underestimating our own procrastination and uh, how it hinders our product productivity and goal directedness. Maybe as soon as this episode ends, um, you know, make a list of all the things that you have been putting off um, while listening to the podcast and see what strikes uh, for yourself and begin to address your own emotions. Yeah. That's what uh, I think would be lovely if all of us are able to do that. No doubt about it. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I did want to take a quick second, Sucheta. You and I have been both so busy publishing this great show that I failed to mention a couple of episodes ago to congratulate you on your 50th episode. So I can't believe we've already published over 50 episodes. So I wanted to congratulate you on that and also tell you it's been a great pleasure to partner with you on this on this great show. So. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Todd. Actually, Dr. Tim Pitchell is my 50th episode. So thank you so much. A shout out to him for uh, kind of helping me achieve such a big landmark episode. So uh, we are celebrating. Three of us are celebrating right now. Absolutely. All right. Well, on behalf of our host, Sujeda Kamath, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thank you for listening today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week as we kick off our next 50 episodes. We'll see you next time on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.